A little girl was sitting on her grandfather's lap as he read her bedtime story one evening. And every now and again, she would reach up and stroke his face, and then she would stroke her own face. And she was alternatively stroking her own cheek, and then his own grizzled, wrinkled cheek. Finally, she spoke up and she said, Grandpa, did God make you? Yes, my dear, he said, but God made me a long time ago. Oh, she said, Grandpa, did God make me? He said, yes, most definitely, but he made you just recently. Feeling their respective faces again, the little girl looked at her grandfather and said, God's getting much better at it, isn't he? On July the 4th, 1952, a young woman named Florence Chadwick waded into the water off Catalina Island. And she was setting out for a swim to swim the channel between Catalina Island and the San Francisco or the California coast. This was no beginner's undertaking, but then again, she had swum the uh, English Channel in both directions. That particular day, however, was foggy and overcast, and the water was numbingly cold. In fact, the fog was so thick that she could hardly see the boats moving around her that were slowly chugging along as, as company. In addition to the cold and fog, she knew that she would be attracting sharks. And several times during her swim, people in the boats were actually firing at sharks to drive them away. But nevertheless, she swam for more than 15 hours before she asked to be taken out of the water. Her trainer tried to encourage her to swim because they were so close to land. But when Florence looked up, all she could see was fog. So she quit. When they pulled her out of the water, they found that they were only one and a half kilometers from their goal, a goal that she never reached. This is a, a dramatic and heartbreaking story of failure. And I imagine all of us can remember something similar either in our own lives or friends' lives or family members when we quit, when we stopped doing something, when we were so close to our goal. But they quit because they had all lost hope that they would ever get to see the finish line. Now this morning I'm going to use two different readings. I'm using 1 Kings chapter 19 and 2 Peter as a, a comparison to the gospel reading. Now I want to show this as a, a statement of discouragement because why it happens and what God provides us to overcome it. Let's consider the King's reading first. Elijah, for the situation that he found himself in, had many parallels with Florence Chadwick's failure to swim the Catalina Channel. Like Chadwick's victory over the English Channel, Elijah had just recently had a stunning victory. He just pulled off and killed 400 prophets of Baal in a mighty contest, and he had slain all of them. And just like Chadwick, who was threatened by sharks, Elijah was now threatened by something far worse, the Queen Jezebel, who had sent him a message that she was going to do to him exactly what he had done to her prophets. And like Chadwick, who could only see fog, poor old Elijah could only see the fog as well. After Elijah had fled Jezebel's murderous agents and come to a distant mountain in the wilderness, he hid himself in a cave. And God asked him, what are you doing here? And this is what Elijah told him. He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. As far as Elijah was concerned, that recent victory over the prophets of Baal amounted to nothing. Why was that? Purely because after that, what he could see, what, what could he see as far as Israel was concerned? Nothing very good. The people of Israel had torn down God's altars. They had killed the prophets with the sword. And Elijah was now the very last one of his kind, showing any faithfulness of God uh, of, for Israel. And everyone, not just Jezebel, was out to kill him. 
God then gave him a rather spectacular object lesson which generated untold numbers of sermons about the small, still voice. Firstly, the Lord paraded before Elijah great and mighty tumults, winds so powerful that they ripped apart the mountain in which he was hiding, then an earthquake, then a roaring fire that swept through the countryside. And after the fire had passed, Elijah heard a gentle whisper. It was the Lord's voice, of course, telling him two things. It told him some things to do, but it assured him that in spite of his feelings of being utterly alone, God had reserved a group of 7,000 people, all whose knees had not bowed before Baal and whose mouths had not kissed him. Now let's move forward a few centuries after Elijah to the events recorded in Mark's Gospel. What has this got to do with Elijah and his discouragement? Well, the parallels are simply this. Elijah was profoundly depressed and discouraged in his service of the Lord. That service was difficult, demanding, tedious, dangerous, and it looked very much to Elijah that there was no getting out of it. In the final analysis, nothing good was going to come out of this. Now, the disciples have not faced anything like Elijah had faced, when Jesus took them to the top of the mountain. But Jesus knows something that the disciples don't know, that their lot is going to be a lot worse than poor old Elijah's. Jesus had recently begun telling them that he needs to go to Jerusalem, but when he gets there, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be crucified, and he will die. Moreover, Jesus knows what his disciples are going to face after his resurrection, and it will not be a boisterous triumphant bringing in of the kingdom. No such luck. It will be more of what Jesus got. Rejection, persecution and crucifixion. A lot of them are going to die as martyrs. And the most powerful testimony to the truth of the gospel among Christians for several generations after would be these martyrs' deaths that so many of them would face. So what does Jesus do? does not give them an object lesson such as he gave Elijah, but he shows them something else. He shows them a vision of the goal. Jesus is transfigured before them in, in a light so powerful and blindingly bright that they were stunned. And there with Jesus is Moses and Elijah. And Luke tells us that Peter heard them speaking about Jesus' death that would soon happen in Jerusalem. Peter starts asking Jesus whether they should put up some shelters. And if that isn't enough, they hear the voice of the Lord saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And at that point, it all vanishes and back to normal. There they are, Peter, James, John and Jesus, just as they had appeared before. And they all go back down the mountain and continue their journey to Jerusalem. Shocked, I, must, um, I would think. But now what is the point of all this? Why did these three get to see the vision of the future majesty and glory of Jesus? Well, Peter tells us what the point is in the New Testament reading of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 16 to 21, where, it's, where he says, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. Now Peter reminds them that what they saw in the mountain was Jesus as he would be when he comes again in power and glory at the end of the age. Peter insists that he was an eyewitness of that majesty and a first-hand listener to the voice of God who said to Jesus, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now why did that happen? Peter says it happened, at least in part, for this reason. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now, just as Jesus knew the hardships and the darkness of persecution that his disciples would face, 
So Peter also knows about what his own disciples and what they will face when he departs. So Peter leaves them with this testimony, one which undoubtedly strengthened him and all the other disciples who did not see that vision as they carried out their mission of spreading the gospel in an environment which was just as hostile to them as it had been to Jesus when he was on earth. Now, does God ever do anything like that today? I don't know. I don't think so. But the closest thing I can think of that even resembles what Peter is reminding us about are the visions of the other side of death that are sometimes reported by those in the beginning stages of dying. I read a book called 90 Minutes in Heaven by Cecil Murphy and Don Piper. And the story goes, on the 18th of January, 1989, a Baptist minister, Don Piper, was on his way home from a conference in Texas when a semi-trailer truck struck his little Ford Escort while he was crossing a bridge. Piper describes that he was crushed by the roof of the car. The steering wheel impaled his chest and the dashboard collapsed on his legs. When paramedics arrived, they could not find any sign of life in Piper and covered him with a tarpaulin, leaving him there from 11.45 until 1.15, as a fellow pastor who had arrived on the scene prayed over to him while they were waiting for the medical examiner to arrive. Now, according to Piper, he went straight to heaven and experienced things he describes as amazing and beautiful, including meeting family members such as his great-grandmother and joining a heavenly choir that proceeded into the gates of heaven. Now, all this while that the pastor was praying, he actually started singing a hymn. I don't know which hymn it was, but as he started singing the hymn, Piper came back to life. Now, not everybody is favored with such a vision or the, the, the sight of what is to come after we die. But in any event, death itself, while it looms out there for all of us, is only the last hurdle to cross. Before that, there are many, many other hurdles. What is our hope in these times of tedious, depressing trial? It is the one that Peter offers to us and the one which God offered to his servant Elijah. Not a vision of howling chaos or quaking earth or burning fire here in this world, but the quiet, small whisper of the Lord. And where will we find that? Peter tells us it's in God's word, which the prophets and the apostles have left for us. It's in the Bible. And what do we do if we find that word? We find a sure testimony, an eyewitness report of the power and the glory and the majesty of the return of Jesus to earth. That is what sustains us during the trials and temptations that we face. That is what gives us the power to endure things. That is what keeps us pressing towards the prize, because it is indeed a prize so glorious that those who saw it on the Mount of Transfiguration were stupefied by it. And it's not unseemly to keep such a prize in mind as we ourselves face temptations or trials or even persecutions. That is what sustained the Lord himself as he was going through his suffering at the end of Passion Week. The author of Hebrews tells us in chapter 12, verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. If a hope for the glory to come is what sustained our Saviour in the worst of trials, why is it any surprise that a hope for the glory to come is what Jesus sets before his disciples? to strengthen them when they are tempted to doubt or to despair or maybe to even give up. Going back after Florence Chadwick had recovered from her disappointing attempt to swim across the Catalina Channel, she said this to reporters, I'm not excusing myself, but if I could have seen the land, I might have made it. It's a fascinating and revealing confession. Chadwick did not link her failure to the cold or to the fear of being eaten by sharks. In the final analysis, it wasn't the hardships and dangers that caused her to give up. It was the fog. And not because the fog is so terrible. No, it was the fog that prevented her from seeing the finish line as she got tired and cold. These she could probably have overcome if she had also had the conviction 
and seen the goal that was so close. Two months after this failure, Florence Chadwick walked off the same beach into the same channel and swam the complete distance. And not only that, she set a new speed record for that achievement. Why? Because she could see the land towards which she was headed. We too can see the land towards which we are headed. We see it now in Peter's eyes with the eyes of James and John, who saw with their own eyes the glory of Christ in his return to, to judge the earth and to establish his kingdom. We see that with their eyes because they have left a record of what they saw on the mountain that day. Paul too saw where we are all headed, so we have his eyes to add to those of Peter, James and John. And those eyes are freely and abundantly available to us by the same quiet whisper of the Holy Spirit, which he has preserved for us in the pages of the Holy Scriptures. Many times we too fall, not because we are suffering such hardships, not because we are threatened by terrible dangers, but because we lose sight of where we are headed. Jesus knew that we would face danger, and he provided an encouragement for us on that mountain when he showed his disciples the glory of what was to come. It may seem that our journey through the next 40 days of, and nights of Lent will be somewhat of an uphill struggle. It may seem that at certain times of our lives, we're in the midst of an uphill struggle. Yet if we anticipate, if we fervently hope for and trust in a transfiguration event in our lives, we too, with Peter, can exclaim, even when we seem to have reached the limits of our strength and endurance, it is good for us to be here. For the transfiguration experience is a transforming experience. It begins in the depths of our hearts and radiates outwards in every aspect of our lives. The invitation to climb the mountain of transformation is always open and is, in fact, an invitation of Jesus to encounter God afresh, then to see ourselves, God's purpose in our lives, and the world in a different light. It is an invitation to see in a new light what God is calling us to be and to do as disciples of Jesus Christ in the world today. Amen.